The Ark of the Covenant is a secret gold-covered object known to the Jews, Christians, and also the Muslims. It has also been made known to a wider audience by being depicted in various movies. But what is the Ark of the Covenant? The oldest text written about it is the Torah found in the Jewish Tanakh and in the Old Testament of the Bible. It tells us about the Supreme God, the one who claimed to be the creator of planet Earth. He wrote ten laws on two tables of stone. These stones were then placed into a gold-covered chest. The chest itself was then closed with a seat or lid with two cherubims, one on each side of the lid. The ark was used for two different purposes. It was above this seat the creator of the earth would manifest himself as the law and the ark functioned as a throne for the creator. Secondly, it was put into a sanctuary system along with other holy objects. No one was allowed to enter the room that housed the ark, except once every year where a high priest brought blood into the room and placed the blood in front of the ark and on the seat of the ark. This signified how the people's transgressions against the law in the ark had been brought to justice by a substitute's blood being brought before the throne. It was later moved to the first temple in Jerusalem. Sometime before the Babylonians besieged the city and destroyed the temple, it is assumed that it was hidden or that it disappeared. Since then, many scholars, theologians, historians and archaeologists have wondered what had happened to it or if it had even existed. Was it a fact or was it a myth? No one was allowed to touch the Ark. On more than one occasion, those who violated this law were struck dead. It also followed the Israelites into war. When it was captured by enemies, they were struck by plagues until they returned it to its guardians. It was thought to have magical powers. Over many years, there have been many Ark hunters looking for the Ark of the Covenant or trying to understand the significance of the Ark. Many have made replicas of it. More than one have claimed to have discovered it, but so far, no one has brought evidence of their findings so they could be examined. But one claim was to stand out from all the others in a very special and heart-wrenching way. The disappearance of the Ark has been a mystery for a very long time. All the sources mentioning its hiding place were written long after its disappearance and is clearly based on either legends or even guesswork. The last time it was mentioned in the Bible was when King Josiah ordered it to be placed back into the temple. But we also know that Babylon conquered Jerusalem in Josiah's son's days well over 35 years later. One interesting thing about this is that there is no mention of the Ark, although other items that was taken are mentioned. However, the Book of the Maccabees that came several hundred years after it went missing claimed that the Ark had been hidden at the mountain where Moses saw the Promised Land before he died. The Book of Baruch, an even younger book, claimed that God let the earth beneath Jerusalem swallow it up and that the Ark would surface again at the end times. And medieval literature claimed the Ark had been taken to Ethiopia and some 20th century speculation included Egypt and even Ireland. But what the Ark is and where it is might actually be connected. The main function of the Ark of the Covenant was to be the governmental seat of God in his earthly temple. But the Ark had many assignments outside the sanctuary and wasn't limited to the sacrificial rituals. Both inside and outside the sanctuary system, the Ark was used to defend God's right as judge and only true God and King of the whole earth. 
His claim to this right was written in the law inside the ark, which stated that he was the creator and that the earth therefore belonged to him. The God of the Bible said, the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. For all the earth is mine. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. That is why the ark went in front in the war against the city of Jericho. Even though this city didn't accept him as God, or being the supreme authority on earth, he could still judge and sentence them. Although Nebuchadnezzar, the great leader in Babylon, didn't worship the God of Israel, both he and other kings and great nations in those days were still judged by God. The Assyrians, the Medianites, Canaanites, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Philistines, and many other nations who rejected God as their God were still judged according to God's standard. When the last king of Babylon mocked God in God's temple, he was sentenced by the Lord by the means of a hand, writing his judgment on the wall in front of everyone in the room. God shows that no matter what religion or ethnic background you have or belong to, you will be judged according to the standard of the Creator and not by your own moral standard or the moral standard of your specific culture. One of the ark's functions was going before God's people in the wilderness and to lead them to their resting place. It was present when a dispute of authority about whom God's chosen was had to be solved. He went before them out into the Jordan River so the river miraculously opened up for them, making them able to cross over to the other side. It took part in the confirmation of the covenant between God and Israel at Mount Ebal. And still, when Israel failed God and was conquered by the enemy and the ark was taken from them, God used the ark to judge the Philistines and humiliate their gods so that they were forced to send it back again. In this situation, God used the ark as a status symbol of his kingship. Even when God didn't protect his backsliding people, he had protected the ark as it represented his authority. This makes it clear that no man needed to protect it and that God would keep it safe all on his own. This also eliminates the possibility of it being destroyed. The ark had been God's throne on earth and the Bible says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. While Jeremiah had just witnessed Jerusalem and the temple being destroyed, he had something entirely different to say about God's throne. Thou, O Lord, remaineth forever, thy throne from generation to generation. So what really happened to it? Jeremiah had been told by God that the city and temple were going to be destroyed. He was prepared and so were many others. The most natural thing to do was to hide away their most sacred object, the Ark of the Covenant. A prophetic word on the end times in the Bible might have given us a clue as to where the Ark would resurface. And it shall come to pass in the last days, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In the 19th century, archaeology got its beginning when different scholars went looking among the old remains found in the Middle East. From tombs and temples in Egypt to historical records and biblical cities in Mesopotamia and Palestine, the Bible as a historically correct book was evident as ancient cities and nations mentioned there, ancient writings from other nations confirmed scripture. Until then, even the city of Babylon had been a legend to many people until they recovered its remains. 
But Jerusalem had been inhabited since the Ark disappeared. Many people had just built new buildings on top of the ancient ones. Thus, the old city became layers of history, one after the other. In 1854, a missionary, James Barclay, was walking along the old walls of Jerusalem. Here he stumbles across the entry to a major cave underneath the old city, full of tunnels and openings. It's been closed off for centuries and it ran the length of five city blocks. In 1867, General Sir Charles Warren did the first major excavations in the old city and the mountain the temple once stood on. He discovered shafts and tunnels beneath ground level. In 1873, Charles Clermont Guenot, a French orientalist and archaeologist, discovered a cherub carved on stone inside the cave. Cherubim were commonly used in the ancient times to guard the entry to a sacred town or place. This cherubim had similar features to what was popular in the time the Ark disappeared. In 1882, General Gordon, a highly respected officer, traveled in the Middle East. And while looking around in Jerusalem, he was convinced that the traditional place called Golgotha could not be the right place. The northern section of the Temple Mount that was cut off seemed like it fit the biblical description and the ancient layout of the city much better. He started excavations there, but he had to leave to help in a conflict in Sudan, where he died and never got to finish his work. However, he did have time to write a letter to a friend containing a shocking statement. Something had happened that he did not explain. The northern mountain that Gordon identified as Skull Hill was also the location for Jeremiah's cave where he wrote the Book of Lamentations, the very same book where Jeremiah had said, God's throne remaineth. Gordon said, the Ark of the Covenant is there. He also mentioned that other temple furniture could also be found there. A very strange statement as he never got to finish his excavation. So how had he come to know? Well, the place was left covered up, and General Gordon's letters remained tucked away somewhere safe. About a hundred years later, a man by the name of Ronald Wyatt had started praying to God to use him to show the world that the Bible was true. Ron had already been looking into the flood story and investigated the possible remains of Noah's Ark. He was also studying the Israel exodus from Egypt and the location where they could have crossed the sea. Finding several old Egyptian chariot wheels it was on one of the diving trips he ended up traveling by Jerusalem on his way home. He was walking along the cliff face with a new acquaintance when his hand suddenly went up on his own. And his hand pointed to a place where some debris and trash was lying in front of the cliff. Without understanding why or how, he heard himself say, There is Jeremiah's grotto and the Ark of the Covenant is there. Ron was confused at what had happened as he hadn't had such an experience before. He had not even thought of looking for it. Troubled, he went home trying to study and find out if the Ark being there could even be a possibility. He studied the Babylonian siege wall at the time when the Ark was last seen. He tried figuring out when it had to have been removed and also the limitations of both the time and the place to hide it. He absolutely saw the possibility that the Ark could be hidden beneath, somewhere in these tunnel systems. He was convinced that God himself had inspired him to find it. Ronald started excavating with his two sons in the place where his hand had pointed.
However, they soon discovered that a large mountain rock made digging downwards difficult. Instead, they started digging a few feet to the right. As they started excavating, he quickly found three niches in the cliff face. Ron thought that perhaps they could be niches that were meant to hold signs, coming from the Roman period. After all, Golgotha was close to the main road at the time of Jesus, and this could have been where Jesus was crucified. The well-known quote of Quintilian explains, Whenever we crucify criminals, very crowded highways are chosen so that many shall see it and may be moved by fear of it, because all punishment does not pertain so much to revenge as to example. The Golgotha location where the Byzantic church was built wasn't by a main highway, but this place was. Could these niches have been used to put signs in that revealed to the people the crimes the criminals had done? He started thinking that this side of the mountain could have been the place where people were crucified. He continued excavating downwards, but the ground underneath was very loose. For this reason, they went back to the original place hoping that they could dig around the large rock. This time, they discovered that they could excavate down between the cliff and the rock, and that the cliff almost formed a roof as they excavated downwards. While digging downwards, he quickly found what appeared to be a rope hole chiseled into the cliff. He was about to find out what it could have been used for. 38 feet below ground level, they found themselves in what appeared to be a cistern-like structure. It was round with stairs going down into it. Ron wondered if it might have been used to store grain and then later was used as a cistern. He shiseled through the plaster and found a large amount of pottery amongst the dirt and debris used as fill to form the cistern. When he showed these pottery pieces to the antiquities authorities, they examined them and informed Ron that some of them dated all the way back to the Jebusite era. The specimens that were dated to the most recent was from the Roman period. He continued along the cliff face underneath where he had found the niches. Because of the pottery and coins they found, they understood that they were on the Roman level. While digging down, he found many finger bones that confirmed his suspicion that this place was once a place for executions. In addition to crucifixions, stoning was also performed during the Roman Jewish era. Outside the cistern structure that Ron discovered, he found another circular structure on the opposite side. Only a base of the circular structure seemed to be intact. While studying the structure, he found a well-preserved section with a wall and a hewn stone standing horizontally out from the wall in the cliff face. A few feet in front of it, he noticed a square rock that didn't look like a natural shaped rock. He carefully picked it up and found a squarish hole chiseled into the bedrock underneath. Could this have been a cross hole? As he examined this hole and cleared away the dirt around it, he discovered that it had a large crack extending out from it. It appeared that the hole was chiseled into a platform in the bedrock. In front, on a lower level, he found several other cross holes. But he couldn't get the thought out of his head that the one on the platform with the crack extending out from it could have been the hole that held the cross of Christ. He remembered the scripture saying that an earthquake shook the mountain when Christ died. Could this crack point to the hole holding the cross? The cross hole extended 23 inches into solid bedrock, while the crack appeared to extend much deeper.
it is not unlikely that they would have known where Christ was crucified and he had many followers who would want to turn the site into a place of remembrance. The Golgotha the Catholic Church and Orthodox Churches both use was first ordered to be built by Constantine the Great around the year 325 or 326 over the remains of an old pagan temple. This happened many years after Christ was crucified, but these remains that Ron discovered was Roman and could date back shortly after the crucifixion. After year 70 AD, the Jews were either killed or moved, and the city was reduced to a Roman camp. This could mean that the site was no longer used for crucifixions. Ron found coins in the building structure dating back to 135 AD and before, but none after. In 130 AD, the Christians was favored in place of the Jews, and this structure was therefore likely built by Christians at this time or earlier. This means that this was probably the first site that was recognized as the actual Golgotha. The Golgotha that the Byzantic Church was built over, about 200 years later, was constructed when knowledge about these places had been more or less lost. The closer the time were to the crucifixion, the more they would have known about the details of what happened. The fact that the coins Ron found in the ancient building were from 135 AD indicates that whoever built and used this ancient structure apparently abandoned it at the time and left the region. The fact that the foundations are still intact might indicate that it didn't suffer destruction at the hands of invaders, but most likely fell into disuse and decay. Eventually, over time, it was covered in dirt and debris. Whatever was the case, the evidence showed that the structure might have been constructed long before the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Ron and his two sons had worked here over a period of nearly two years. They continued looking down at the Roman level for a cave or an entrance to a tunnel, but without any luck. Ron then found himself impressed to break through a crack in the cliff wall. The old prayed and continued to feel impressed. They used hammers and chisels and after a short time they could see an open space behind. They enlarged the hole so they could get through. The cave on the inside was 15 feet high and wide. Ron had first gotten excited when discovering the cave thinking the ark might be right there inside it but it was empty and led to myriads of shafts and openings inside the mountain. Ron continued to search every cave and opening he could possibly find inside the colossal cave system. For two years they went back and forth between the States and Jerusalem to earn money at home so they could come back and continue the search. In December 1981 they continued their work inside the cave system looking into any opening crack or cave they could find. However, all three of them ended up with a cold. Ron's two sons went back to the States and Ron had to rely on help from others to continue. He wasn't going to give up and felt God had promised him that he would find the Ark on this specific trip. But now he had used all of his money, he was sick and the work was very hard and exhausting. 
One of the locals that were helping him went through some of the smaller openings as he was thinner and could get into places Ron couldn't. While looking around, Ron found a chimney-like passage and from there a small tunnel where Ron had to exhale in order to squeeze himself through. He then noticed a stalactite about 16 inches long in front of the cliff wall. Behind it was a hole, and Ron tried to look through it without any luck. So he enlarged it a little and could see a cave inside, but it didn't look too promising and appeared to be a cave full of rocks. But he was determined to look everywhere. He enlarged the hole enough for his helper to crawl in, but he came quickly out again with a terrified look on his face, crying, What is in there? What is in there? I'm not going back in there. And then he tried to get out of the cave system as fast as he could. Now Ron realized that there might be something there and enlarged the hole enough for him to squeeze himself in. It was now January the 6th, 1982. There was about 18 inches of clearance between the rocks and the ceiling. Ron started shining his flashlight down through the rocks to see if there was anything underneath. He saw some dry rotten timbers and under it some dry rotten animal skins that turned into powder when he touched it. He then saw something reflecting back, something shiny and golden. At first he thought it could be the Ark of the Covenant, but when removing the animal skin he saw a gold venner table with a raised molding around the side which consisted of an alternative pattern of a bell and a pomegranate. Ron felt sure this had to be from the first temple or the missing tabernacle furniture and could be the original table of showbread. He then started to investigate the chamber more closely and looked around. He used his light and noticed a crack in the ceiling. Climbing closely to the rocks to the rear of the chamber, he saw a stone case right underneath the crack. It had a flat stone top which was cracked in two, and a smaller section moved to the side creating an opening into the stone case. But the top was too close to the ceiling for him to be able to look inside it. He noticed a black substance in the crack above it and some more of the black substance on the edge of the lid leading into the box. The crack in the ceiling was directly above the cracked part of the lid where it was open and some of the black substance had to have fallen into the case. It was at this time, as Ron recalls, as the instant realization of what had happened here dawned on him that he passed out. when he realized that the crack in the ceiling was the end of the crack extending from the cross hole found in the elevated platform many feet above him and the black substance was blood that had fallen through the crack and into the stone case. He knew the Ark was in the stone case. But the most overwhelming realization was that Christ's blood had actually fallen on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Ron was passed out for some time. 
he later came back to the cave and managed to confirm that it really was the Ark of the Covenant. He informed the Israeli government of the discovery, but was told to keep it quiet. But Ron could not stay silent for long. Ron visited the chamber several times and reported that several items were in there in addition to the Ark of the Covenant in the stone case. The seven branch candlestick holder with their lamps from the original sanctuary, the golden altar of incense, the table of showbread, a golden censer, an ephod, a mitra with an ivory pomegranate on the tip, a brass shekel weight, oil lamps and a brass ring, and a very large sword. In the back of the ark was a small open cubicle which still contains the book of the law, presumably the one Moses himself wrote. To his understanding the book of Genesis was not there. It amazed Ron that these scrolls written on animal skins were still in perfect condition. He then began to realize that the ark had to have been taken into this chamber somehow. It couldn't be where he entered because he had cut through stone to get in. Removing some of the stones he found a larger entrance going south towards Zedekiah's cave on the other side of the road where the cherubim had been found. This tunnel was however blocked with many large rocks and Ron had no way of moving them out of the tunnel from where he entered. Ron had a laboratory in Israel analyze the blood remains he had found in the crack and on the mercy seat of the ark. The result shocked them beyond anything. First of all, in this analysis, I took the blood into a laboratory in Israel. I asked one of the people I work with in, in antiquities, where is a good laboratory that does reliable work? And they said, such and such, such and such. I took it. I just said, please examine this blood and tell me what you can tell me about it. All right? They said, well, look, we're going to reconstitute it. We're going to put it in normal saline and keep it at body temperature for 72 hours with uh, gentle swirling. All right, that's their business. That's great. I said, now I want to be there when you check it out. They said, fine. So I was back. They checked it out. I said, now uh, they said it's human blood. We can tell that. They did whatever tests they need to do. And then I said, take some of the white blood cells and put them in a growth medium and keep them at body temperature for 48 hours. And they said, well, that'll do no good because it's dead blood. I said, would you please do that for me? And they said, okay, we'll do it. So anyway, I said, I want to be there when you take it out and examine it. So I was back there. They took it out, examined it under microscope. And the one technician called the other one over there. And then they called the boss over there. And they were talking Hebrew a mile a minute there for a little bit. And they looked at me and they said, Mr. Wyatt, this human blood only has 24 chromosomes in it. Everybody else has 46. You see 23 from your mother, 23 from your father, 22 autosomes from your mother, 22 autosomes from your father. You get an X from your mother, you may get an X or a Y from your father, all right? This blood had 23 chromosomes from the mother's side, one Y chromosome only. You see, the ch a child could not have developed if they hadn't had the autosomes from the mother. So all of his physical characteristics were determined by his mother's side of the family, her autosomes. His maleness was determined by this one Y that came from the source, not a human male. Then they said, this blood is alive. And then they said, whose blood is this? I said, it's the blood of your Messiah.
When the blood went on the mercy seat, it was proven that it was sin against this very law Christ took the penalty for. Our sins against God's laws, not human laws or any other religious laws. And these are the laws we need to repent for having opposed. And furthermore, that God had really sent his son to die in our place. Ron wanted to show everything to the world right away, but God stopped him. On his fourth visit, the chamber and tunnel were all cleared up and the furniture arranged in their order. Ron instantly felt the presence of angels in the room and he saw four angels, two standing on each side of the ark. They told him they were assigned to protect the ark and then they told Ron to put his camera on a tripod and film. They lifted the mercy seat and helped him take out the Ten Commandments written on the two tables of stone. Ron then held them, showing them to the camera. They then told Ron when God had planned to show this to the world, at God's appointed time, when national Sunday laws are made at force shortly after that they will be shown to the world. Ron instantly knew what the angel meant as he had studied the topic beforehand. The angel was talking about the enforcement of the mark of the beast mentioned in Revelation 13 and 14 as the last deception and test coming over the world before Christ's second coming. The law in Christ's blood is a testimony countering a man-made version of God's commandments that will be forced upon people all over the world. Also, it will confront the wrong conditions of salvation that has been preached to many people by religious leaders. Ron died in 1999 without seeing it fulfilled, but he knew the evidence of what happened was on tape and he used his last months and years to tell people about the love of Christ, his sacrifice for us, and then he warned people of the coming mark of the beast law. Please listen to his important message and warning. Well, this set of laws is the one that God's subjects have to keep. It's under his throne in heaven and on earth because Moses was told to make his dwelling place, a God's earthly dwelling place, after the manner shown him in the mountain, or the pattern shown him in the mountain. And so anyway, this mercy seat was the earthly throne of God, and it still is. And the Shekinah glory dwelt there for hundreds and hundreds of years until the Jews became so rebellious and paganistic that God decided he wouldn't dwell among them anymore. We may take a look at that in a little bit. But anyway, that is what the mercy seat is all about. There's one statement in scripture, and that's in 2 Thessalonians, where I think it's around the second chapter, it talks about the man of sin. It says he was set in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, to look at it quickly, it would imply that in order for him to set in the temple of God, that there will have to be one built, because there's no one there now. On planet Earth, at this point in time, there is an individual who him and his ancestors, <coughs> in his position, changed the law of God. They eliminated the second Commandment which says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything in heaven above or earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down to them nor serve them. That kind of interfered with uh, the way they wanted to do things, so they eliminated that. 
They divided the number 10 into two, so the number would still be 10. Yes, the tables of stone were found in the Ark of the Covenant. I personally, personally removed them with the assistance of four angels who lived in the mercy seat, which I would estimate weighs about 900 pounds of solid gold. And one of these angels told me to take the tables of stone out of there. He said, God wants everyone to see those. And so I took them out, backed up, stood there, frozen in place. And uh, well, I just can't describe my physical state or mental state or anything else. If, if, you know, I didn't have some physical evidence to prove it happened, I think I had a dream or something. But anyway, they are now available to be shown, but we won't say, uh, actually they're on a stone ledge right in the same chamber. That's where the angel put them after I handed them to him. I didn't know what to do with it. And uh, I was told that these are to be presented with the blood evidence when the mark of the beast law is passed or enforced. Now, I know everybody wonders about what it is, the mark of the beast. You've heard all kinds of rumors, stories, and all of this. I'll tell you quick and simple. If you keep the Ten Commandments that God wrote upon those tables of stone, and about which he says in Psalms 89, 34, those of you that are right down text, you'll want this one. Psalms 89, 34. He says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. He spoke the Ten Commandments from the mountaintop. He wrote them in stone, and he says, Nothing will change. Right? If you keep that law, you will receive the seal of God. Soon there will be a set of man-made laws best intentions, surrounded by a barrage of salubrious soliloquies and sepulchral solicitudes. That's all kinds of stories and all of this, instigated by the devil to make you think that this is the best thing that ever happened to the human race and that you could just want to go along with it voluntarily. <clears throat> These man-made laws will require that you break God's Ten Commandments. Christ said of the Pharisees, for it is in vain that they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you keep those man-made laws and break God's Ten Commandments, you will receive the mark of the beast. Nobody has the mark of the beast at this point in time. You can only get it after that those laws are enforced. Now, is that hard? When a bunch of man-made laws are passed, and in force that require you to break God's Ten Commandments, the penalty for not keeping those laws is that you cannot buy or sell. That is the mark of the beast. We will say, friends, keep this law and you receive the seal of God. Keep the laws that man has made that force us to break God's law and we have the mark of the beast. Amen. It may sound a little simple. I know there's people that say it's the computer chip and all kinds of stories. It is keeping the laws of man instead of the laws of God. As Christ said to his disciples when speaking of the Jewish leaders in his day, he said, for it is in vain that they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. God did not accept Abel's or Cain's offering of fruit and vegetables. He will not accept any substitute for 
our loyalty, loyalty to him, but keeping his Ten Commandments. And there will come a time, folks, when if you do that, you will not be able to buy or sell. Now in Psalms 89, 34, he says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Okay? That means that the Ten Commandments, which is the covenant, he won't change that. He spoke it from the mountaintop, and it's recorded in the 20th chapter of Exodus. He won't change that. When I saw the tables of stone and saw what they said, they said exactly the same thing that the original Hebrew text says in the book of Exodus. Exactly. All right? And that will not change. Now, the Bible warns us that Satan will come with signs and lying wonders. All right? How can we tell what is the miracle of by Satan? Because he's a supernatural being. All of the fallen angels are supernatural beings. They can do things that are miraculous from our point of view. How can we tell what's of God and what's not? If they say God's Ten Commandments are binding, to break those is to sin. Then they are God. If they say anything other than that, they are not God. And we have no business listening to them, regardless of what kind of miracles they are performing. Uh, the tables of stone will be on display after the National Sunday Law is enforced. That is the exact words of the angel, as I recall.